you everyone uh, to this uh, VP Duck Memorial Lecture uh, hosted by the Institute of Chinese Studies. Uh, it's wonderful to see such a varied group of uh, people here uh, from very, so many walks of life, a busload of students from uh, JNU, old colleagues, old friends, um, and members of the China Studies fraternity, young teachers uh, and uh, historians of note as well. We feel very pri uh, privileged uh, to be holding this uh, lecture uh, with support from the VP Dutt Foundation, for which we're very grateful. Now, uh, Professor Dutt's biography is in the invitation card. I should merely say that uh, he lived a very long and productive life born in 1925 and passed away in 2011. Uh, he was a pioneering uh, Indian scholar of China and had a long career in research, in teaching, and then in public life uh, as uh, a, mem a member of the Raj Sabha. Um, he mentored, looked after a large number of China scholars. Uh, having, I don't know how he got into Chinese studies, but he had his higher education in Lahore, then in Stanford University, Beijing University, and Harvard University. Uh, those of us who remember olden times, remember that we, we used to refer to him, I'm afraid a little flippantly, as another one of the spotlight professors. Does anyone know what a spotlight professor was? After the uh, the news, the uh, 9 o'clock news at 9.30, a wise person gave 10 minutes of commentary. And uh, on the China thing, as well as international relations, Professor V.P. Dutt was in his element. And much of us were much the wiser for that. In fact, one would only wish that uh, just once in a day there was a spotlight professor to enlighten us and we didn't have to put up with everything that goes on on contempt all the channels of uh, television, news, <laughs> news channels these days. Um, Which are mostly there. Yes. Now, he, uh, with, uh, he was Pro Vice Chancellor of Delhi University, but before that, I think in uh, 1965, uh, Shirimati put me right, if I'm wrong, 64, he was brought in to set up the Department of Chinese Studies at the University of Delhi. Uh, which became the Ch Department of Chinese and Japanese Studies and is now the Department of East Asian Studies with career added. He was a very prolific uh, writer and his writing is uh, very um, straightforward to read. No jargon and uh, all, the <coughs> all that sort of stuff. Uh, uh, no, no, I didn't look at you. Uh, and, um, but he, uh, and much of his writing, uh, many of his books, have become textbooks. He also write, wrote, and I'm not sure of the status of this, I think he did his PhD on the 1911 Xinhai yep. Revolution. Uh, and was that published? Yes. It was published. So people who, I can now see that um, the usual biographies leave out some of the, everything that doesn't relate quite to India-China relations is put in the back cover. So uh, along with uh, his wife, the charming uh, Gargi Dutt, uh, they co-authored uh, two very well-known books, China After Mao and India's Foreign Policy, which I'm sure is still uh, going strong. Um, so that is about Professor uh, V.P. Dutt. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker, an old friend, personal friend of many people in this room, distinguished sinologist, a historian, and also a friend and supporter of the Institute of Chinese Studies. Uh, I needn't tell you what the topic is, but many people have uh, are going to be asking, I hope only before he begins and not after he finishes, is what exactly is convergent comparison? Because uh, we wait to hear that. Uh, he is presently at uh, Duke University and uh, is engaged in projects that, uh, and uh, also with the India-China Institute in, in the US. 
Um, not, directly. Not, not directly, but anyhow, he is a great supporter of the India-China studies, uh, including in ICS, and through his students and other people. He was once a young brat in the uh, history department of uh, St. Stephen's College during his MA with a very, very distinguished uh, group of young uh, men and women, uh, young men only in those days, who have made their mark in uh, history, in Indian history, and have continued in various walks of life. Some I can see are guiltily looking uh, as though they're not here. <laughs> so, um, uh, we greatly look forward to this talk. I've had the privilege of seeing the PowerPoint, which I can assure you has many pretty pictures. And if we don't understand by the end what is convergent comparison, we will have had a nice picture show. So, <laughs> we'll have much more than that. So, so, well, uh, I might say that he's going to speak for um, uh, usual lecture time is 50 minutes, right? Your time yeah, yeah. program to yeah, 50 yeah, minutes? Yeah, yeah. And uh, after that, I'll make some very brief remarks if I have anything sensible to say. And we can have a little bit of uh, questions from the, from the floor. Particularly like to invite uh, the students. There are many students here of East Asian Studies and of History. Uh, please um, you know, feel that you don't have to let, let all the ambassadors ask the first question. You can also <laughs> ask the first question. So, uh, Prasenjit, we're really yeah. looking forward to Thank this. You. I'm going to go down here because unless I see what's there, you find maybe even more diddled than some of you. Huh? Uh, yes, yes, that's a good idea. Uh, thank you very much, Patricia, and thank you very much, uh, uh, for uh, having me speak here and the Institute for Chinese Studies and Ambassador Kanta and Shimati. And uh, is this uh, okay, the sound? Lift the mic a bit. Okay. Uh, um, ooh, this is uh, <laughs> very dark, but that's okay. Uh, yeah, maybe one, one, yeah, that's, that's perfect. Oh, that's good. Yes, uh, yeah. So, um, uh, I should uh, begin. I, I was, I've been told by many of you, you see, I couldn't figure out, I am an inveterate academic, and uh, although I've been uh, sort of pulled into the Institute for Chinese Studies to do a lot of practical and pragmatic speaking, which uh, somehow I do unashamedly, but um, but <laughs> this is I wasn't clear. I had given most of my pragmatic talks <laughs> in Delhi, so it remained for me to to give this one. But uh, several of you have come up and said you have no idea what I'm talking about. So I will try to uh, hopefully, uh, as Patricia says, uh, she she uh, apologized for me in advance. Uh, that if you don't still don't follow, enjoy the pictures. <laughs> but uh, I will try to uh, make it somewhat entertaining and hopefully informative. Okay, so what I um, I have wrote a book uh, not too long ago where I talk about history as circulatory. A lot of uh, some of you have heard this, and uh, that histories are not tunnel visioned and channeled of a nation or of a civilization or of whatever subject, uh, but they're always circulatory going from one place to another. They don't end up uh, in one place. Uh, a historical event often disperses, becomes fluid, goes into different dimensions. And uh, I think uh, we can say that this kind of circulatory history, which has not been recognized until uh, recently, has probably been around since the Bronze Age, uh, where Afro-Asia has really been part of one big circulatory uh, um, formation. And there's a picture of it that you can see how you have different innovations that travel to different places and, and so on. And it had to do with uh, this interconnected region, had to do with bronze technology, agricultural, agriculture, cities, empires, and trade routes as well. So there was circulation of technology, of uh, species, animals, germs, people, plants, goods, knowledge, all manner of thing. Knowledge is perhaps uh, one of the most important uh, uh, features of the circulation. 
and I've been trying to do something that is even more academic than this talk, which uses the idea of oceans as the metaphor for circulation and um, oceanography, really, you know, uh, how waves travel and so on, relate quite a bit to these things. So what I want to argue, the basis, the basic assumption is that history is open-ended. It doesn't close off into a national history because that national history also changes into something else somewhere else as well. So, so we can grasp this logic of this circulatory history, as I said, even very early in the early, the first empires. For instance, uh, some of you may have heard of the Achaemenid Empire. We have the greatest Indian, ancient Indian, ancient historian in this room. And uh, it makes me very nervous to talk about it, but I did check with her, Professor Ramla Thapar, uh, who, uh, and it seems that uh, we can see this as early as in the Ashokan pillars and uh, how there was this influence from the Achaemenid period and so on. And let me just uh, show you this. Uh, that's Persepolis, uh, where the, the, the ruins of Persepolis, and you see the columns and the and the manner in which uh, the idea of imperial sovereignty gets propagated and so on is very much, and they of course did have connections off and on, as Professor Thapar says, uh, in different uh, times. Uh, but to go back to circulatory history, perhaps uh, from an India-China perspective, uh, the most uh, important dimension of this in early times is Buddhism probably one of the most uh, uh, globally important forms of circulation uh, that takes place and it, its impact on social, culture, monastic economy, salvation practices, art, everyday life, literacy, writing, uh, uh, and all manner of things. And But Buddhism itself, the way it, you know, we think of it as going from India either by the southern or the northern route to China and East Asia, but in fact it goes from many different places. And the most important northern influences on uh, Chinese Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, really came from the, the main carriers were Sogdians and other Central Asian groups and so on, who had already transformed it in some ways before it showed up there. So, so what do we have here? We have something that emerges, that merges, that re-emerges, very much like oceanic kinds of circulations, right? And you can also talk about continuity and change. And I'll give you a few more uh, examples about uh, the impact of Buddhist uh, ideas on Confucianism and Taoism. Just as in India too, Hinduism of Shankara was shaped very much by Buddhist understandings and so on. So, but before we go into this uh, lovely material, I should say that while materially and aesthetically, uh, historical societies are quick to accept <coughs> goods, practices and ideas, However, at the official level, as it were, intellectually or discursively, there is much resistance, right? There are gateways, there are um, blocks and, and uh, authorities uh, feel challenged and so on. So we keep that in mind. That is why I'm doing convergent comparison. So I showed you Persepolis. And I show you, you know, I was in uh, Chiang Mai in northern Thailand uh, a couple of years ago. <laughs> And I was just wandering the town, and all of a sudden, I see these two Ashokan uh, pillars. And I say, wow, is this an Indian consulate or something? But no, it was just a regular, ordinary Buddhist temple uh, in Chiang Mai. And so I took this picture, and then I tried to do some research about it, and found that near Chiang Mai is this uh, great uh, Ashokan pillar with the Buddhist chakra, as you will see there. You know, sometimes they have it, sometimes they don't, uh, when it becomes semi-secularized and so on. So you do have this kind of circulations going on in many different parts, and who knows how many other parts of the world you can find this kind of pillar as well. I guess, was it Nehru who, who chose it? Uh, yeah, <laughs> he had some idea of some cosmopolitanism about this, for, uh, about the whole Ashokan period. Okay, here is uh, something a little more foreign, a little more Chinese, uh, which is uh, what we should be doing. Uh, this is, uh, on the left is this beautiful picture of the Taoist Avalokiteshwara. Avalokiteshwara was the Mahayana um, uh, savior, salvationist uh, bodhisattva. 
And uh, the Chinese name, and there's a very interesting history of uh, Avalokiteshwar, who by the 11th century in China, in East Asia, has a sex change, becomes uh, Guan Yin, the goddess of compassion. Somehow compassion was perhaps more associated with female worshippers and so on. So, but long before that, when Avalokiteshwar was still a male figure, uh, the Taoists realized, the Taoists in China realized that the popularity of Buddhism in China had to do a lot with the salvationist dimension, right? Just like Jesus is a salvationist figure. Before that, Buddha is very much a salvationist figure. And, uh, and they decided that they would have to invent their own uh, salvationist figure. So this is the Taoist Avalokiteshwar, who is called, for those of you who read Chinese, is Chiu uh, Ku Tianzun. Right, that Jukhu Tianzun, who is the uh, savior figure, uh, the salvationist figure of uh, the Taoists. So, but it's not just a one-way street. On the other side, what you have in the circulatory traffic is that uh, the Buddhists, when they went into northwest China, they realized that without some of the Taoist sort of infrastructure, as it were, cultural infrastructure, they couldn't penetrate. So they disguised the Taoist North Pole, the Peto uh, God, as um, as a Buddhist uh, 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 as a Buddhist figure and a Buddhist form of worship. I couldn't quite find a picture, and that allowed it to circulate through much of uh, uh, Central Asia. So what we see here is how these different circulatory forms become acceptable, right? And the basic principle is that. There is a novelty uh, can be seen in a vernacular medium or in a vernacular in a novel medium, right? So it uses these different media as it were. Either the message or the medium itself uh, changes, changes the reception and the understanding. Okay, um, now I talk a little bit more about circulatory history. Uh, so historians have engaged in various different conceptions of time, and we won't go into those. We know about national histories and so on. But circulatory history, as I've said, is interested in the flow of time, right? How do we actually see what happens in time, over time, as it were? What are the vehicles, bodies, agencies, and processes that embody the flow of time? This allows us to recognize what allows us to recognize and measure the flow of time itself? Well, one we know is light, daylight, sunlight, seasons, all kinds of things. The other is water, water often circulates and so on. And the third is really history and the way in which we record past to point towards the future. So, and I want to argue ultimately that historical time is not fundamentally different from uh, the flow of time in nature and the model of natural process is actually a very important and useful to understand the history of uh, circulatory flows. I will go on from this. So what is the rationale for circulatory histories? I developed, I mean, how do I, why am I interested in it? I developed the argument in my last book called The Crisis of Global Modernity. And what I want to say by talking about how histories merge and emerge from each other, that's a circulatory, a kind of a liquid way of seeing continuity and discontinuities. Circulatory histories have to be thought of transitively, what happens uh, to them, and processually, and not in terms of origins, right? So I often give the story of my own um, historical background, uh, not necessarily autobiographical, but historical. So I'm from Assam, which I don't hear, I don't need to explain to anybody where Assam is. And, but the Assam, as you know, in the 13th and 14th century was, uh, was conquered by the Ahums. They settled it. The Ahums. Now, who were the Ahums? It's very interesting. The Ahums were a vassal state in the southwestern, what is now Yunnan province of China, where there was the Dailue Kingdom. The Dailue Kingdom, or Dali as it's often called, was in fact uh, never conquered by the previous Chinese uh, rulers, but until the Mongols came. And the Mongols came and they overran Yunnan and they overran Burma only, of course, to be hit by malaria, which is what always kept people out of Burma. Uh, but uh, so what happened? The Dai 
went on, were pushed down, became the Thai of Thailand, or at least a part of it. This is a complicated, I'm simplifying. The Ahoms, this vassal, went to the west, and they had very good water technology and conquered the Brahmaputra Valley, right? And that is where, after two centuries, one and a half centuries, they uh, Sanskritized a bit, but they kept their uh, Buddhist uh, and other uh, uh, sort of uh, culture with them. And then, but when they decided to Sanskritize, they also brought people from Central India, from Kannauj and so on. And we are really a product of that mix, right? We are this, this South Asian and Southeast Asian mix, and I did my 23 and Me, and it showed 13% Southeast Asian. So, <laughs> you know, so we could see how the Mongol invasion produces what we, what we may be, right? So we don't have to, now each one of you can <laughs> trace your own ancestral history in some ways to understand circulation. So this, I'm not denying institutional processes, repetition, this, that, and the other, but what I have to say is that uh, even these domestic uh, processes are porous. They have, they are, they imbibe circulatory form. Even the most uh, die-hard bureaucrat in an institution will be influenced by things outside and will not just repeat the institutional process if we look at it through certain eyes, right? So, um, so but, so, but the rationale is that I want to argue for history as not a nation-based thing. I want to argue for it as a shared collective and planetary heritage. And in fact, it is pretty much national histories that have led not only uh, in modern history to two major world wars and other conflicts, but to the environmental devastation of our planet because it is very much a competitive form for control of global resources. So I want to show that history cannot be used as a justification. There is a circulatory form that goes, and it's a collective heritage. OK, now let's go to modern histories of China and India. On first sight, of course, the two histories are very different. But especially from the 16th century, after the, um, the uh, what is called the, uh, the Columbian Exchange, that is the connection with America, after America and gold and silver, was mined in the Americas, uh, and this, of course, led to, and there's a whole history here that obviously we can't go into, but then it was Asia, it was China and India to a great extent, that from the 16th century became the sink for global silver from, the, uh, from Latin America. And uh, this also, of course, contributed to the great wealth of these uh, societies at that time. Mughal India and Ming Qing China, or Ming, uh, Ming China, Ming and Ming Qing China. And, um, and once this starts happening, you also get accelerating uh, connections uh, between different societies. It's the global capitalist system that is beginning to take an emergent form and connect different parts of the world, right, much more closely, and we begin to see the effects. Uh, we see it then as well, and I don't want to, but let's just look at modern histories. You know, we can track almost parallel developments in India and China from 1850s. So you have the 1857, what do we call it now? The nas first national war of independence, is that, is, anyway. And you have the Taiping Rebellion, right, in China, which is also, and they're very similar in the forms of the extent to which they absorb modern or non-modern phenomena. And, uh, but it's really after that, after that, you begin to get the failure of both lead to new elite responses in both societies. And you have indigenous modernizing groups in the newly formed public sphere and economy, and they generate many common debates. All the debates that you can find in 19th century India, not all, I mean, there are some specific to India, but many of the debates you can, you can find in China, you know. Uh, the same kinds of you look at the media, look at these kinds of things, including, as somebody said, that the Indians and the Chinese were the first to uh, argue for abolition of opium and things like that in uh, popular media in the, in the late 19th century, and made a sort of a global, had an important global role, Stephen Remner's work. Uh, so you have on social reform, political representation, even more specifically, look at the politics. The, in India, you had the moderates, right? Those who said the British are being un-British, right? Uh, we want more British-type British, uh, British type rule in India. So these moderates were, constitutionalists were 
in that larger sense, who wanted to work with the British and so on. Similarly, the constitutionalists in China of the Hundred Days Reform also wanted to work with the monarchy. They wanted to produce a constitutional monarchy and do reform through the existing setup. By 1906-1907, both were uh, disgraced. And you had the extremists in India, who now make a much more radical argument. In China, you have the revolutionaries, and they share many of the common uh, elements of the discourses of that time, including racism on both sides. <laughs> and, uh, and this becomes very much a new basis. And then you go on. In the 1910s, you have mass movements, and you have leaders of mass movements arising at the same time. Gandhi, and soon after, you have Mao. And you have the mo their modes of mobilization, of appeals, and so on, although they're saying completely different things in terms of their ideological content, are very, very similar. And I will show you a picture soon here. So, so you have the, the, the framework of the mass movement, its goals, rhetoric, visual, representational techniques, and results really allow for a certain comparability. So, so what do I mean by convergent comparison, right? Convergent comparison is central to understanding the circulatory history and how, in fact, circulatory history has an impact on social formations. You can call them nations, you can call them societies, whatever. And it refers to ways in which these circulatory forces are, in fact, institutionalized in different societies as well. So what I call the zone of convergence is the impact space of circulatory uh, forces, right? And this impact elicits or demands often a response. It demands a response from the society. Right? Why else will you have revolutionaries and extremists coming up? They're responding to something outside that didn't work inside in the earlier phase, right? Um, the responses of very and the responses itself of these different social formations in turn forms the basis of convergent comparison. So they're responding to this convergent force, and when you look at how the two of them behave, that is the basis of that makes it comparable, even while it has a similar um, impact. Uh, the, the circulation force, even though they may be very different in in terms of the inner structures. So this method also allows us to see what is novel and what is continuous, not only in what happens, but also how it is represented, narrated, and discoursed. That is its historical meaning, right? Like historical events, so we talked about historical processes, historical events, <coughs> uh, narratives and representations, what we call historiography, or how a, an event is narrated, um, also uh, become dispersed. They change, they, they look back to the events, and they have, they mix in with other different uh, events and different meanings and so on. So, uh, you know, I just think of it whenever I have to give an example to East Asianists, I said, look at how, whether it's British imperialism or Japanese imperialism, how they celebrated, so let's say Japanese imperialism celebrated <laughs> their Pan-Asian empire in the 30s and so on. Look at what is happening now. Japanese children are being made to read textbooks that are, uh, some of them, most of them are ignoring it, but read textbooks that have been written about the Japanese empire by people from Taiwan, Korea, China, you know, in this joint formation often comfort women also have a say, the Taiwanese aborigines also have a say. So what is the meaning of their history? It's completely changed, it's dispersed, it's gone back to another event, it's circulated back but with a completely different meaning, right? So we have to figure out a way to, in, to understand these forms. Now, let's come to the contemporary period or the post-war period. The Republic of India and the People's Republic of China were, of course, founded on very different political principles, as we know. But after riding the mass and rural movements, and note, both of these societies had major rural movements, uh, one much deeper than the other, but still. Uh, leaders in both societies faced comparable imperatives of nation and state building. Right? Where did this come from? Right? It was the impact of some kind of circulatory force that had them respond so similarly. China, following the Soviet Union, explicitly constructed its <laughs> now it's 
Now it's back to daily temperature, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, explicitly constructed its command economy upon anti-capitalist foundations, while India pursued autarkic development with strong socialist characteristics. And just to sort of simplify, to continue to look at the similarities, you see there are three waves which occur within 10, 15 years of each other. Wave one is the struggles of state formation and nation building, right? And you have similar problems. You have Tibet, Georgia, <coughs> you have border problems in India, Kashmir, Northeast, and so on. Wave two is the by the 70s and so on. You have the logic of citizenship and rights. And it appears just as much in India, uh, particularly after the emergency, but even before. And in China, after 1980, they, there is a demand for a new constitution and things like that, and lots of new rights and so on, whatever you think of it. Then wave three is this last uh, 20, 25 years, 30 years of responses to post-Cold War globalization and neoliberalism. And you have very similar, I see Huang Ying Hong here, who is doing comparisons of modes of land grab and land acquisition in China and India, which are very comparable. And you have, of course, many interesting common formations, often responding to you know, global discourses uh, about the importance of human capital formation, about both China and India have much greater welfare programs actually in this period than they had, and why is it at this time, at this, what are they responding to that's doing that? So, now the, a little more of the conceptual part. Now, one of the things that uh, I have argued, uh, well, uh, is that uh, circulatory forms, uh, that is all these different goods, ideas, and so on, they come into a society, they ingress a society more easily and more incrementally and less noticeably through everyday routines. This is what I call culture with a small c, right? Mm -hmm. It's your everyday practices and so on. But when penetrating through more systematic means, they often encounter gatekeeping by <coughs> doctrines of superior culture, civilization, doctrines of authenticity, right? What is the proper role of woman in our society, right? And why should she wear short skirts or something like that, whatever. So, you know, you have this, oh, but, you know, at another level it keeps penetrating. While earlier societies also face, is there some way we can get some air? <laughs> if not air conditioning, at least some circul circulation, as it were. <laughs> it's either, uh, uh, maybe we leave the door open. I think that might be a little bit. <laughs> I may have to go back <laughs> to Simla. <laughs> uh, so, you know, while earlier societies also faced this, you know, this contradictory sort of, um, or this what I call an aphoria, this difference, this, this tension between high levels rejecting and ordinary culture accepting, uh, in the nation state it becomes much more problematic, acute, much more volatile. Why? Because I think nations are actually themselves globalized. In. Nations are fundamentally global. So what do, I, what do I mean by that? Take a look at any national constitution. Take a look at the principles that drive it. They're much more similar to each other than they are to anything historical. Right? I mean, look, you know, the example I gave is those of us who grew up in the 50s uh, will remember that, you know, for most Indians, that is, the lower classes, uh, a child was a child until they could work in the fields or in the whatever it is. Look at every constitution, and we're all moving towards that. A child is a child with rights only at the age of 18, and there are certain rights and responsibilities. So the notion of the child has changed. There are all these kinds of responses. The notion of what is a deviant or not in society, what what is history is also changed. All modern uh, national histories have to have ancient, medieval, modern, <coughs> and then you have a renaissance of some kind that brings the ancient somehow into the modern, and uh, all these kinds of things. They're all, they're all similar if you look at world history, right? So you have the constitution of people, what makes people and people formation and so on, is a very global thing. And 
but at the same time you cannot afford to acknowledge and recognize that the nation is in fact global because of course your sovereignty is based on the distinctiveness of your history and culture. So how do you reconcile these two issues? Right? How do you reconcile these issues? And my point about convergent comparison is showing how different societies have reconciled through small c and big c, right, in this mode. Okay, so we also have to talk about why are they, why are nations like that? They are like that. They have emerged in the crucible of capitalist competitiveness, first in Europe, and national histories, you know, and so there is a model of the nation. The model of the nation has to make people sleek and competitive in order to be able to acquire resources. I mean, there are also internal reasons to raise, there is a contract within the nation that we will raise your level of happiness and livelihood and so on. But at the same time, you have to be trained and refigured to be competitive for global resources. Right? That is the motor that moves it, and it is very much tied to capitalism. Even though you might have had socialist states, which were in fact ultimately very much in the competitive game. Right? The Russians and the Chinese and so on were very much in the competitive game, not necessarily through capitalism, but through the idea of conquest of nature and control of resources. So, um, but as I said, the big, the aporia is that they have to misrecognize the sameness because the sovereign power of the nation is often based on its ethnic, historical distinctiveness or what I call authenticity. This is how the national self is created versus the other, whether foreign enemy, rival, or internal others. I want to give you an example of the Malaysian flag. I mean, you know, this was created at a time, I guess, when and, you know, it's the U.S. flag, but with a crescent and moon, right? I mean, I think it's sort of uh, with the crescent and uh, star. It, it sort of you know, gives you a good sense. And all flags have a very similar structure as well. Uh, just like national anthems are uh, very much, very similar. They're military, martial, marching tunes and things like that. So discourses and, oh, I'll give you an example of, and we can talk about this, I'm giving an example from China, but you can talk about it from any part of the world. You know, when you have people after the Belgrade bombings or something in the late 90s, you have people demonstrating against America and so on, huge demonstrating rock throwing this, that. Next day, many of them are in the, like in India too, they're in the embassy applying for visas and so on, right? <laughs> this indicates the tension between your global globalness and your nationness, right? I mean, it's there, we see it in many different uh, dimensions of life. Now, so let's talk about now the particular uh, cultural story that I want to tell. Fundamentally, there's no enduring inside and outside of nations. Rather, there's a volatile tension between its globality and nationness. Purity and authenticity, I've said, are policed by the state and nationalists, largely at a discursive level, but although some transgressive arts are also. And, you know, most rational discourse actually ignores this contradiction between the global and the national misrecognition, right? These tensions are often too acute for logical discourse to rationalize. Although, of course, you still have myths which carry them up through. But it is really through the visual, oral, smell, sounds, touch, what I've called the cultural sensorium, that, uh, that this uh, is the space where the tensions between global, national, local are negotiated and managed. Okay. Um, now, I have to, uh, I first uh, thought about this topic, well, I thought about this topic much later, but I first, it struck me when I saw Gigi Sakaria, who's a famous Indian artist and photographer, uh, produced his, uh, I was in, in, in Shanghai, and there was the first, uh, you know, uh, West Heavens conference, and they brought in a whole bunch of, uh, you were there, right? Uh, at that time? No. Anyway, they brought in they brought in several speakers and then they brought in artists who were from China who were working on Indian topics and Indian artists working on China topics and things like that. It was a very interesting exchange. Jesus Karya had on some in some mall in Shanghai, he had this thing playing. I have no idea who he was, but suddenly it was called any parallel. 
and um, let me just I hope we can see a, a YouTube just to give you a sense oh. no okay forget it but it's very interesting you know it shows Mao and Gandhi in these different very interesting formations in which they are expressed as I said you know the idea that these people are completely different but it is as it were the infra culture the space in which they are expressing their message in which they represent themselves uh, that is very similar so you have he shows them both giving uh, mass addresses and it's a very similar format and form and he shows them uh, as leader and the uh, young so Mao and Tang and Nehru and Gandhi and Nehru you know and their, and their different roles he shows them sitting at their desks he shows them in many different postures and you can see this infra culture you know that uh, this medium which is conducted to portray them in very similar ways so the cultural sensorium I think permits uh, uh, sort of ingress into a culture through various modes of engagement including what I talked about vernacularization and novelty right so this includes displaying or packaging the old and new forms and vice versa right both things kind of happen so these technology and techniques of representation in the sensorium can convey a different message from the content the medium and message you know uh, what was his name uh, Marshall, McLuhan. Marshall McLuhan told us about medium and but actually they are very interrelated and you can get a message from both and if you know how to do it you can do it quite well so uh, and you see this in any parallel now let me give you the the big the centerpiece of the talk this is chairman Mao goes to Anya how many people know this painting nobody yeah one or two <laughs> you know it I'm sure <laughs> Chairman Mao goes to Yan Yuan, is supposedly uh, Chairman Mao going there in 1922. It is a picture by Liu Chunhua, who was an art student in Beijing, in Shanghai, Beijing Academy, I think, of art, at the main national academy. And he did this painting in 1967, and it became the most reproduced portrait of any figure in the world during the Cultural Revolution. And um, it is, now let's look at the content of this picture. It com actually, uh, Elizabeth Perry has written about this uh, picture and has written about this, this whole issue of An Yuen. An Yuen was a very famous 1922 coal strike, coal miners strike, which actually it was Liu Shaoqi and somebody else, uh, I can't remember who, who went and addressed it most of all. But later in the Cultural Revolution, Mao also went, but later in the Cultural Revolution, he was shown to be the real hero of Anya and Mao Zedong. So this was the politics behind the painting. Now, but let's look at the visual form. What does it have? It is 1922. It's quite early, right? Mao is in a, a scholar's garb, right? He's not uh, in a, he's in a uh, traditional robe. He's carrying an umbrella, which is also a beautiful scholar's umbrella. But his other hand is clenched like a revolutionary, right? He's a, no, no Confucian figure will be shown with a clenched hand. So this is a, a, a revolutionary here. So it's combining these different uh, modes, right? Scholar gown, cloth shoes. You can't quite see the shoes. It's cloth shoes. Uh, and most of all, the background is a kind of Yunhai. For those of you who know who Yun, what Yunhai, Yunhai is the sea of clouds, right? When you go high up and the clouds are below you, it's a, it's a very important, very beautiful aesthetic trope in China. So it's a Yunhai and so on. So it's a very mixed kind of uh, modern revolutionary determination as well as a traditional figure. So this is a kind of a vernacularization of a revolutionary message as well. Now, let's see. But the infracultural language of this is different. Because what is this painting? Let's go back. You know, this painting was taken from a classical painting of Raphael, right? The uh, Renaissance painter. And um, 
it is a painting it is modeled on the painting of saint paul saint paul going i can't remember the particular episode but when he goes with great determination to convert the jews and so on and it is very much based on that here is the painting of saint paul and what you see also is that it has very much this whole renaissance sort of lushness in the background and the and the clouds and the hills and the mountains and sort of a very transcendent kind of figure right so the infracultural language is a biblical figuration of Mao Zedong. And you know that a copy of this uh, print, of this painting, hung in the Vatican for a long time. Because the Vatican thought it was a Chinese missionary in China. <laughs> <laughs> Until they discovered that it was Mao Zedong, and they quickly put it away. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, I can't remember how long, but it was hung in the, in the Vatican for a while as a great Chinese missionary leader. So, you know, you have the cultural language is saying something else from the political language here. And, um, and then you go on and there's, so there's this religious figuration of Mao and the leadership and so on that, of course, reaches its climax in the Cultural Revolution. And here you see the climax on the other side. I mean, you know, it's a halo and it's worshipping and, you know, people have to read the Red Book before they do their farming and so on to see, to apply the correct principles like reading very much a Bible and so on. And uh, for instruction on whatever matter you do. So this is, uh, reaches its height at that point. So, but of course, you know, if you were to ask, uh, the Chinese of that time, whether in fact this religiosity is uh, acceptable, most <laughs> probably they would say there's nothing religious about it, right? So um, now we have also a similar kind of, let me see if I missed out. Uh, yeah, no. <coughs> so we have a very similar image in, uh, in India, right? The first thing you see here is uh, the vernacularization of what has been called the modern geobody, right? The nation as a territorial entity rather than as a civilizational entity. But how is it vernacularized? It's vernacularized in the most intimate of domestic figuration of the woman holding the flag and so on, right? So this is domesticated. Then you have this um, <laughs> Gandhi's uh, assassination you can see also, it's almost like there are three bullet wounds or something, just like uh, what happened to Christ, right? And of course, it is a depiction from Pieta, which is uh, in uh, uh, Michelangelo's Pieta in uh, the Doma, right? Is it in the Doma? Yeah, yeah, same, yeah. Uh, so, upper, above our images of Mother India, it's easy to see the vernacularization of the geobody and also to see the incrementally how it slides into the Christian imagery for the world, uh, imagery of sacrifice, right? So the whole idea of sacrifice is actually a Christian idea that, which is, of course, that idea exists in India and other places and in China and so on, but it's the Christianization of it that makes sense in a modern world. Right? And because that is the image of uh, sacrifice that is accepted uh, um, in many parts of the world. So visuality is the easiest for us to be able to recognize this, this uh, complex relationship between medium and message, between vernacular and content and, uh, and circulatory form. But orality is also very important. Most evident dimensions of orality, I've said, are national anthems, which have heroism of the romantic music, of martial and hymnal qualities very often. I'm also, I'm a great fan of uh, Indian, uh, Hindustani vocal music. And you know, you listen to voices from 30, 40 years ago, the whole mode of voice production is so completely different. That today's voice production is much more global than anything you heard. Uh, even at the time of Kesar Bhai Kirkar, you know, and they're, they're like a different world. And so you have these ways in which people adapt to whole different, and it's, it's very much a way of making the circulatory part of your, yourself. I also give you a, perhaps, 
a very interesting uh, thing about olfactory, about the smells, right? <coughs> now, how many of you know what a durian is? It's the most stinky uh, uh, fruit in the world, right? And, you know, in the 18th century, when Europeans and others would go to Southeast Asia, they would think it's just another bad smell, you know, and so on. But in the 19th, mid 19th century, that whole rage against Turian, the whole began, right? Tulian, two one show Tulian, and uh, they. It was unbearable. It was un. But what happened? What happened was that garbage got removed from the cities in Europe in the mid 19th century. So they had no experience of this, this. This richness, this cornucopia of smells. Right? <laughs> so it became sort of, so you have ways in which, and now of course in any hotel you go to in any major Southeast Asian city led by Singapore, durian's not allowed, durian's not allowed. And yet, interestingly, you're not a Southeast Asian unless you're a durian lover. Not a real, authentic Southeast Asian, right? So it's very, and then you have, of course, many sartorial, the ways in which the Sanyatsen suits, the Nehru jackets, and all of these things, the Chibao, so on. So, but what I want to end with is to say that we don't just see these simply as adjustments to modernity. Rather, they develop their own language between the influx culture and content to negotiate this contradiction, this aporia between uh, globality and nationality. And nationalism, right? So this is how this. So that's what I have to say. So hope people. Uh, well, uh, thank you very, very much for that. And we did indeed see some uh, interesting pictures. Um, now uh, we have a little time for discussion. Sure. So, uh, You'll start. Um, I think I might finish off. I'm still dazed. Uh, but um, uh, who, who would like to begin the discussion? Raj. Very rich. Well, uh, yeah, I think it was a very, very interesting uh, talk. And something that reassured me tremendously because, as you hinted, nationalism is taking us into very monolithic directions, away from flow, away from uh, yeah. circulation. Yeah. The whole circulatory history concept is being denied in, yeah. let's say, Trump's America sure. or Modi's India. Yeah. We're beginning, becoming much more monolithic. And I think the kind of infracultural negotiation that you talked about mm -hmm. toward the end of your talk is becoming rarer and rarer in the India of today. I mean, it, it, it's there, but it's never recognized as infracultural. Well, it won't be. That's the whole point, right? Yeah. It's below the yeah. radar. Yeah, but uh, so that's for perhaps the only way in which it yeah. can be done. Yeah. But then if the state gets more and more repressive, yeah. even that might not be allowed. I mean, I'm just thinking of purity and pollution, the uh, the self, the national self and the other in Trump's America, you know, whether mm. it's the wall against Mexico or any, uh, you mm. know, fear of immigrants, mm. or our attitude toward Bangladeshi immigrants in, in Assam, for example, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the Northeast. Um, there are many instances of this in Modi's India as well. Mm. So what do you think of that? I mean, how do you keep up? Is it, is it a sort of a clandestine infracultural negotiation? Well, uh, yes. We're, we're, we're doomed to, in, uh, uh, there cannot be any explicit and open embrace of the other. Um, no, I think Modi's what part? my goal is to show this infraculture as the real history that is going on mm -hmm. at some level. And it is the reality we need to embrace. So it is a normative position for me. And uh, whether or not it eventuates, at least if people become more aware that this is also how your history is taking place. And the question of whether it can be blocked, I think less and less. I mean, you know, the Chinese have the greatest firewall in the world. And, uh, but you still see, and you know, you still see a lot of stuff going through. And you know, there are all kinds of things. How is it going to manage global supply chains without people having the possibility of, of access? And this is, uh, so I'm an agnostic on the question of what can, what will happen, but I think it's very important to realize that we see these two things happening at the same time, the one being denied by the other. And I'm not sure that even the teaching of Hinduism will 
ultimately <laughs> or the teaching of the history of Hindu India will ultimately be very different from uh, different uh, histories, uh, maybe closer to, you know, histories we don't like, but <laughs> it will be drawn from that. Yes. Can you see any convergent yeah. comparisons between India's Narendra Modi and China's Xi Jinping? <laughs> <laughs> well, all over the world we see a certain personalization of authority. I think, uh, uh, yeah, I think that there is a great deal of personalization. And, and how and why this is taking place, right? You see, you, you know, you have uh, people, uh, Trump, certainly personalizing it as much as possible. Uh, he doesn't listen to anybody. <laughs> and uh, you have, uh, but you know, I think in China it's happening much more uh, institutionally, the personalization of authority. Uh, in India, I, uh, I am not going to venture. I think that is also happening. And, uh, but you see it everywhere. You see it in Putin, you see it in Viktor Orban, you see it in the Brazilian guy, what is his name? You see it, yeah. You see it in uh, Recep Erdogan. I'm going to Turkey tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> see what you uh, Who? I, I'm American. So far, I'm still allowed. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, you know, they're responding to something. What are they responding to? That's a whole different story, right? It is globalization, modes of globalization, modes of historical forms of responses to globalization. Because this is, this is, I see it very much as a, as a cyclical thing. You know, we've had it for 150 years. And the last terrible version was what led to the Second World War, right? It's this uh, populist uh, forms of uh, personalization of dictatorial authority and so on. And you can trace it, and you know, one of the great scholars who didn't really develop this point of view, but I rely on a lot, is Karl Polanyi, who talks about how nations open up and then they close up when things get rough, right? But he saw the closing up as a way of nourishing the internal, but this closing up can be very, very mean, right, as we are seeing. In fact, it's always been mean. I mean, there is some nourishing of institutions and so on, but mostly it's been directed, uh, it's been politically directed against minorities and others. The yes. gentleman way at the back. Oh, oh sorry. Sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, go on, go on. Uh, <laughs> Professor Dora, could you tell me whether we can factor Tagore in this narrative? Uh, how Tagore impacted China and also uh, in turn he was impacted by China because you remember t when Tagore got Nobel Prize, it was, he was hailed in China and then yeah, yeah. also he visited China and there was the May 4th moment during the same yeah, time yeah, yeah, but yeah. during Tagore's uh, time. Yeah. So how they impacted each other, Tagore's visit, Tagore and the Chinese history? That's a very interesting question. It's almost as if there were two counter-circulatory movements going on. You know, the May 4th was very much the dominant response among a certain middle class. By the way, there was a whole, you know, it was just restricted to probably 1% of the population uh, for the first three, four years, uh, or less, probably much less, probably point point zero zero one percent Whereas there were other movements in China, quasi-religious movements, Sanjia Hei, these kinds of redemptive societies that had huge followings in the tens of hundreds of, uh, certainly tens of millions, if not more. But Tagore, I think, uh, which had an alternative vision of modernity, much more like what we have in the middle class societies, middle like in India and so on, that's also comparable. I think Tagore appealed to aesthetically to that counter dimension of radical modernity, right? And, uh, and it didn't stand a chance in China, especially after 1923 when the Communist Party and the KMT sort of developed out of the May 4th movement, took it as its uh, signal uh, birthing uh, episode and engaged in mass mobilization. So I think it was a kind of a count, how could I put it, I mean this is being very complicated, but it's a counter, um, counter modern, modern trend, right, uh, kind of thing, if you know what I mean. So. 
But to this day, you know, that I have always argued this when we talk about Than Chung and people, uh, Professor Than Chung and Wang Yishu, bless us so, uh, that they represented a thread of India-China relations of a certain type of modernity that never disappeared, right? Today there are more publications of Rabindranath's collected works in translation in Chinese than in any Indian language. <laughs> you know, I mean, what do you say to that? You know, so there is a, a substratum, maybe a countercurrent, <laughs> right, that can surge at some point. Not that, but some countercurrents do surge. Okay, we invited uh, questions from the young people. One down yes. back and yeah. then Dan Santosh. Uh, Professor Diora, you actually mentioned, uh, I'll refer to a joke you cracked, but I think that got me thinking. When you said no authentic Southeast Asian cannot be a durian lover, that made me think, oh, how do we... You have to be a durian lover. Yeah, sorry, yeah. an authentic yeah. Southeast Asian has to be a durian yeah. lover. Yeah. But isn't your whole talk about the fact that we cannot make a monolith out of any culture or impose any norms. Yeah. That, that was one thing that got me thinking. Yeah. Another thing is that you mentioned that, you know, the historiography can be very different from the history. Nationalist historiographies can undermine important historical facets. But when we are referring to India and China, uh, the very idea of something being an India or being a China mm. is some way derived from some nationalist historiographies yeah. or even civilizational historiographies. So even to get our reference points to break free yeah. from these ideas, yeah. we have to acknowledge these ideas and how do we actually strike that balance and it is well known that civilizations have had contacts but then beyond the fact that we acknowledge that yes, history is circulatory and people have had influences, mm. how do we really undermine the reality of the nation state or the reality of even civilizations developing in a certain way which have even if you talk about Assam under the Ahom kings we are acknowledging there is an Assam. So that is one point that struck me. Thank you. Uh, good complex question. Uh, I think there are two levels at which one is a first let me sort of say that as I said we cannot operate without existing context concepts right. We have to try and go beyond them, but that doesn't mean that you abandon them, right? Yeah. It's like an aufheben of some kind. But uh, what you, so that I'm not denying these issues, because as you say, the idea of India gets produced, and that has a history too, yeah. right? Which is goes beyond historiography. The idea of India is also goes into historical time, right? So yes, I mean, it becomes a very complex operation. But I think for me the most important thing is to completely see it as completely interwoven, right? To see the outside influence, to, and as far as possible not to uh, make something very essentialist, to go back to an old point. And these are different ways of doing that. Now what kind of political position you can take from that is another matter. Right? I'm not doing that, I'm laying out the groundwork for this. As far as the, your question about uh, Southeast Asia, I think it can be also seen, it, it is a joke, it wasn't meant seriously, yeah. but lots of Southeast Asians also don't, but those who claim say that you cannot really be, right? So it's a position, but uh, I think it's also a way of actually denying the statist uh, <laughs> idea of what is a truly modern person who doesn't eat these stinky things, right? So uh, it's sort of, in that sense, has another role. Right, so question. Okay. Uh, sir, it was a very detailed presentation on circular historiography, and we is are it, seeing... Is it, is it on? Uh, uh, it is a very detailed presentation yeah. on the circular historiography between India and China, and it is also continuing because we follow many governance models, whether in slogans or the yeah. programs and all. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you see the message, as you said, message is the med uh, medium is the message, yeah. but India and China are in a different mediums in digital messages. Now, we have something which is blocked, we prominently use the uh, mediums which are totally blocked in China. So. How do you see this thing? Uh, where do you see the this uh, cooperation, or this will lead to a conflict? 
because neither Google, Facebook, neither Twitter is allowed in China and uh, neither uh, Paidu is popular in India or the West. Paidu is not popular in India. <laughs> but there are lots of Indian uh, Chinese programs that are now TikTok and all kinds of things. Right? Huh? That is bang bang. has been lifted. There's litigation going on. Okay. No, but the thing is that. Uh, sorry. You know, but let me try to answer, right? Testing question. Yeah, no, I forgot my one sec. Um, so. Yes, I mean, but look at all the Chinese programs. What are they modeled on, right? And what were they a replacement of? So in a way, the medium is still the same, although the message may be different, right? And that medium uh, also constrains people in different ways uh, and probably in similar ways. One of the things you see, I don't know how much actually, you know, one of the great things is how political interference and so on and all this intervention and all these killings and so on happen through new social media, which is happening also all over the world in different degrees and different kinds of things. It will be interesting, I haven't figured out in China how that social media is, uh, what kinds of effects it has on society. But I think it would be very interesting to sort of see. I bet there are some very similar moments, as well as the differences and divergences. Does anybody else want to respond to that question? Huang uh, Yingshu. Uh, thank you for the presentation, very really interesting. Actually, I just wonder one question about uh, circular history. I, I want to know, actually, uh, you highlight a really interesting uh, factor of the history, make good in a circulating way. But circulatory. Just, uh, yeah. Circulating way. I just wonder, it is uh, subjective or it is objective. In terms of subjective, that means that it can be manipulated like in the hands of the nation yeah. and sovereignty or maybe NGO or some others. Yeah. That's yeah. subjective yeah. of the history. Objective, that means that it is like a rule to painting or to something. So even you want to manipulate, you must follow this kind of rule. So I, can you uh, uh, like, uh, push forward this argument and, uh, as answer to my question as is subjective or objective or is both? Well, that's not, I understand your subjective point of view, but the objective is... Uh, objective is like... It's like a, what I, the way I understand is what we call it, intersubjective, right? I mean, that is different people still absorb certain kinds of rules and apply. But I would say there's a difference between subjective, in your sense, including the intersubjective, which often makes for... Um, what I call historiography, right? How people seek to control and manipulate. But when I talk about objective history is that it escapes these manipulations. What is happening there goes, it can come back in a different form, it can go to the... And circulatory is not just coming back to the same point. Circulatory is going from place A to B, B to C, D, C, D to, you know, and all that, uh, in different kind of circuits, right? And it may come back in a different form, but doesn't necessarily. So maybe we can talk about the subjective yeah. objective. Now, I've more. seen uh, two people there, one Santosh Pai and one Mr. Uh, Professor Goshal over here. If we can have your we questions, then we together? Need, Should we uh, take uh, together? No, I think separately, perhaps. Okay. They're likely to be on fairly Very different, different. <laughs> wavelengths. Uh, uh, Santosh, okay. will you uh, lead off? No, I, he's, he's you know, one, you've got it. <laughs> You know, you want a small, you want a small comment on the lighter side about the durian you mentioned, <laughs> <laughs> because you know I lived in Southeast Asia, I think much longer than anybody else yes, in this right. room, and in the 60s, uh, nobody talked about the smell of durian. durian. Uh, I lived in Indonesia and Malaysia, both the places, and durian used to be like a mango, yeah. uh, and durian has some other aspect. Uh, it's considered to be hypodesiac. <laughs> yeah. uh, so the Chinese <laughs> like it very much. And that's why at certain seasons, durian gets very expensive. Now, anyway, that's different. But, uh, you know, my question is, you mentioned about circulatory history. Yeah. At the same time, you also mentioned that history is also cyclic. Yeah. 
Now, see, the two process to my mind go sometimes together yes. in the sense that you have responses <laughs> and reactions yeah. together. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, what somebody mentioned about, you know, Modi's India and all yes. that, yeah. uh, it may be, I mean, this personalization is nothing new in the yeah. history. Yeah. Yeah. Even Mrs. Gandhi talked about yeah. history and wanted to put some capsules yeah. at one stage. Yeah. So I think the process goes again back and forth and all that. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the circulatory and cyclic thing yeah. is, is a kind of a sort of, you know, that goes simultaneously yeah. and that creates again further process of circulation. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you. I don't have any. But it's never, you know, you never step into the same water twice. I mean, you know. So it's never exactly the same. It's always something different. But there is a, but also both the reference to the past and the actual sort of repetition of several practices uh, is uh, is very much part of circulatory history. Sure. Sure. Right. Now, uh, last, uh, I think, comment from yeah. Santosh. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Professor, thanks for that very enriching talk. My question is, have you had a chance to reflect on the impact of digital technology on your hypothesis? Uh, do the patterns get blurrer? Uh, is it getting quicker, you know, this replication, these mm -hmm. pattern making? And uh, because I have a baby hypothesis. Okay, I mean, let's hear your... Because I come from the legal domain and in 2016 when China came out with the cyber security law, yeah. uh, almost immediately the GDPR regulations came in the EU. And India now has a Data Protection Act which is modeled on the GDPR. Yeah. But our e-commerce law is looking at China's model and calls data a national asset. Yeah. So, these, uh, so in this example, yeah. I think the pattern is getting a little blurry. Blur. Because, uh, you know, we get influences from many places because the internet economy is very intertwined. Yeah. And between India and China, there are a lot of common stakeholders yeah. today. If you look at you know, all the, yeah. I think, uh, the apps and everyone, there's a lot of commonality. So, I just wanted to ask you, have you reflected upon this? What is the impact of digital technology on your idea? Well, I'm going to uh, beg here that I'm a historian. <laughs> <laughs> If I could, uh, I think it would take me another half lifetime. At this moment, oceanography is good enough <laughs> for me to learn. <laughs> but uh, I think those are very interesting questions. I have, I have and, two interesting questions yes. there on uh, the Please. digital world. Yes. yes. Um, as the new uh, space of, uh, or the new ocean yeah. of uh, um, uh, circulatory paths and pictures. So I think that at this point we should uh, wind up, unless anyone else. Are you else giving is... some wind up questions, comments? Well, uh, I'd hardly call them that, but um, I think that what we've had is um, a, a taste of a, a work in progress. <laughs> Thinking, <laughs> I hope that you haven't written the book already, right? <laughs> no, right. So, uh, because I, I think that the the idea of the circulate the circulatory histories is very appealing. Yeah. Because if we just sit here and ask us, and we're, we're so transfixed with India and China and India-China relations and circulations and uh, parallels and so on, that we forget that really, was there an India? And when was there an India? And what India was it? Where, you know, uh, it's not the same as it was in those... Uh, there's, pit, there's maps. Mm -hmm. Remember Mother India's yeah. sari was a much more capacious garment which went this way and that. And now it's, it's, really, it's really shrunk <laughs> <laughs> since 1947. <laughs> it doesn't include Burma and also yeah. it's much smaller. Yeah. So uh, I think that the, um, you know, there was no India, there was no China, and yet we are taking these ideas of, you know, our, our nations and relating them in different ways. Mm -hmm. And to introduce your circulatory, mm -hmm. the, the circulatory model, I think is a, is a challenge to yeah. the way one automatically turns to, uh, tends to think and write histories. And uh, that, that is something <coughs> very challenging and very important. But I, what I find is from the, the way you developed it, that it is very hard 
to stick to that when you come to empirical, uh, empirical details. That there are, there are two sort of um, models for dealing with this in modern times, because you uh, leapt from ancient times and empires to modern times. And uh, we found two stories coming, that there were parallel developments. Now that in, in recent, and that goes along with a theory that there's an impact from outside and responses of different cultures which are very similar. I mean, the responses, similar responses from inside. So the old idea of, you know, the, the parallel developments or the impact and response are very, they imprison you and you cannot get back to the, gro the, the ground of circulatory histories from yeah. the position that we're now, our thinking is embedded in. So I think you've thrown out a challenge, but it's very hard to stick to the program and think it through. Among the things that you offered, which I was very impressed with, uh, well, there was so much, but one of it was your use of vernacularization and the big C and the small C, uh, things that happen at a cultural or tangible level, uh, which which um, happen without design, if you like. You know, you're still thinking there are states which are acting and cultures which are acting. There are also the uh, subliminal things that you referred to, and that have no explanation in the uh, you know in the ordinary way. So when you're dealing, um, and some people have looked at. I looked at these, particularly aspects of material culture, uh, which, uh, for instance, Madhavi Tanti's work on uh, chi Chinese em embroideries or, um, uh, you know, circulating around and, and so on. So uh, the question of taste, material objects, material tastes, and so on, this gets left out of this particular picture. And what I think in, in particular is that the uh, you need, one needs to think, at least in modern times, mm. of uh, the technologies of production mm. and reproduction, mm -hmm. which are not national. There, well, I, I think your digital thing was bringing that up to date. Mm. But if you look at print, printing mm. and printing technologies, mm. or um, lithographic technologies or <coughs> photographic technologies. You're looking at things which are under the radar, which we don't, which are not controlled, and which in which you find circulatory fashions and um, histories being built up. And assumptions. And assumptions. And in particular, the the um, lithographic art that you that you produced the the Mother India pictures. You related them to the Pieta, mm. but you find that in fact, under the radio, radar, mm. there has been this very dense interconnection mm. at the level of popular art, which no one regards mm. as art, therefore they don't mm. write about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, you find that the, uh, you, you know, there's, there's a very common uh, thing called the, the laughing Buddha that mm -hmm. people put in their gardens or at their doorways to welcome people in. Uh, it's also, uh, it's, uh, the original prints seem to have been made in China in the 20s and 30s. Mm -hmm. but no, that's not the or origin of mm -hmm. the figure. But uh, you find them coming out in Indian calendar art, mm -hmm. uh, printed in Shivakashi. Mm -hmm. And you find them coming out in, in nationalist art with Patel and Gandhi and uh, so on, all, all sort of uh, um, sitting, sitting on, the, on the Buddha, who usually has many, many children. So there, there are many, many instances of these unknown circulatory things which are dependent on technolo uh, technologies and um, which, which nobody really notices. And I think the print culture, uh, the print culture part of it yeah. is really a very interesting theme to fu function, uh, to look at. And the world of advertising mm. in which the imagery 
is tran uh, transnational and global and yet uh, um, local. So I think that we've got a, a lot of very rich ideas here to think about. And uh, thank you very much for introdu <laughs> introducing them. I think if we're going to take circulatory histories uh, seriously, we have to go back and ask you about that first map you showed and why it was like it was, what were the big circles, what are the stars, and where we take it in today's world, where the global, the, the global scene is dominated by artificial intelligence. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, uh, we, we have a whole new thing, thing coming, which yeah. historians can plead that they don't understand. <laughs> but yeah. someone has to understand the world in which yeah. we are now trying to cope with it. So, thank you for uh, enriching our discourse and our thoughts and uh, challenging the conventional and um, le letting us take away a lot of new ideas that, that we can think of operationalizing. So thank you very much. Thank I'm sure you. I speak. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, firstly, on behalf of the Institute of Chinese Studies, I thank Professor Prasenji Dwara for agreeing to our request to deliver the Vipita Memorial Lecture. I also thank uh, Professor Patricia O'Brien for agreeing to chair the session. I thank uh, Ms. Anradha Dutt for uh, generously supporting us in the organization. I have to thank the audience for keeping the discussion lively, complex, as current, as history, like historical as it can be. And I also have to thank uh, Dr. Ritu Agarwal and my colleagues at the ICS for helping me in the organization throughout. Thank you, everyone. So, here's to which of them. Yeah. 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 Yeah.